Okay, this video is super important. We're gonna talk about how do you keep flowing? How do you stay in that flow state that is not just enjoyable, but optimal for progressing you towards your goals to feeling a sense of connectedness to things? Not just when learning a new language, but learning any skill. And not just in learning a skill, but in living a good and meaningful life. Flow is perhaps the most essential concept to really understand and grasp for all of these things, as crazy as that sounds. And so we're gonna talk about what flow is and how to get into it and on a technical level. But before we do that, let's kind of regroup it into everything we've already done so far. Once again, to review, our goal here as language learners is to experience a sense of belonging because we're able to flow in this group of foreign language speakers in a different culture. And we do that by transforming ourselves to fit that culture to fit that linguistic environment and we do that by cultivating a perspectival knowing as a sense of awareness of what it's like to be a native speaker within that linguistic environment in that culture and the way we do that is by cultivating these skills or practicing and training these skills of attention and movement etc cetera, etc cetera. and we know we're doing that properly when we're experiencing this thing called flow. So what is flow? We keep using this word all the time in the mimic method. And in this slide, I wanna break down the various definitions. Um, because I use flow so many different ways, I decided to kind of give different names, like four different kind of names for the word flow. First one is S-flow or systems flow. And when I say the flow of Spanish or the flow of Chinese, what I'm referring to is a system flow. And we have these complex dynamic systems of interacting moving parts that form a functioning whole. So for example, Spanish, we have all the different uh, phonemes, s, f, sh, u, r, k, a, i, u, a, o, all that stuff. They combine to make syllables, which combine to make these melodic patterns, right? And then somehow all those melodic movements are meaningful in a greater context of Mexican culture or Cuban culture or whatever it is. So all these parts, these moving parts, but somehow they cohere together and make a coherent system, which people within that system, in that S-flow, are able to understand each other. In fact, that is how they're able to understand each other because they're all participating within that S-flow. And notice my use of the word participa participating participating as participatory knowing. S-flow is the, the thing we're participating in for that participatory knowing, okay? So that's the S-flow that we're trying to get into. I like the metaphor of a river, right? Imagine there's a river and all the Cubans are swimming in that river and then you wanna swim with them, right? So that's what it means. I don't wanna learn Spanish. I wanna swim with the Cubans in the Spanish river, right? And all the other Colombians and the Spaniards as well, right? That's what S-flow is. Now, when I'm swimming with the Cubans and the Spaniards or the French people or the Congolese, whatever it may be, then I experience something called flow state, which is a scientifically studied, measurable state. Your neurochemistry changes, your neuroanatomy uh, changes in certain ways. Lots of different things you can go into to actually verify if somebody's in flow state. Uh, but what it is fundamentally is a deep, deep sense of engagement with your environment with the S-flow, right? And there's a good acronym to remember it, STIR, selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness. So you're not self-conscious, um, your sense of time kind of dilates and you're just kind of in the here and now moment. There's a sense of ease and effortlessness. Once again, things flow and it's very rich and deep and meaningful experience. So E-flow, we call it peak state, optimal experiences for human beings. You're gonna be in this uh, E-flow that um, we're going after here. And when you're in E-flow, you tend to experience P-flow, which is progress. So that's steady compounding of skill and power as you're moving towards your goal of belonging or mastery or autonomy, whatever it may be. Um, that, when we say, oh yeah, we're really flowing right now, um, we could be referring to just things are progressing. Right now I'm making all these videos for this course and I feel a sense that Things are flowing, people are getting interested, they're learning, my sense of understanding of all this stuff is improving. It's a really good experience of just feeling progress, right? And finally, when I say flowing, you can say that's the act of navigating an S-flow while experiencing E-flow and P-flow, right? So I have the flow of Spanish and I'm engaging that flow of Spanish, experiencing flow state, E-flow, 
And every moment I'm in that conversation with a Spanish person, my ability to speak Spanish and flow in Spanish is increasing. I feel this increase in my power. So S flow, E flow, P flow, we flowing, all right? Now the question is, how do I keep flowing? How do I keep that E flow and P flow going? That's the tricky part. And this is the key slide. You wanna memorize this slide and hold it in your mind throughout the entire training you're doing here because it's super important, as simple as it is. And this is what's called the flow channel, also the skills challenge match. So there are various things that trigger flow state or induce a sense of flow. And one of the primary conditions for that is something called the skills challenge match. And that's to say that you have a certain task you're trying to perform, right? Such as communicating with a person. And if it is too challenging for your level of skill at this moment in time, you will experience negative emotion, frustration, anxiety, shame, all these negative things that no one likes to experience, right? Like, ah, oh, this is really hard, I, I can't get it, oh, it sucks, right? That's when it's too hard, things are too fast, too complex, whatever it may be. On the other end, if it's too easy, and you know, there's like a you know, high school Spanish class, and it's like, repeat after me, hola, 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 right? And it's like 30 minutes of that, you're going, ah, right? It's just so boring, and you become disengaged, right? So you're either overstimulated and then you burn out and you're disengaged, or you're understimulated and you're disengaged, right? Then you're not in flow. But if you get the skill, the challenge itself rather, to match your skill level perfectly, then you'll be engaged and you'll be in the flow state. Now, if you're in the flow state and you're in that E flow, then you will get better and better and experience P flow, which means your skills will increase. And as they increase, if you keep doing the same task, eventually it'll get bored, or boring rather, and then you'll become disengaged. So what do you need to do then? Well, you need to increase the challenge so you can get back into flow state, right? But you can't increase it so much that it's too hard for you and you get frustrated and anxious, right? So this is all pretty straightforward when I explain it to people, but no one actually ever does this. Why? Because we're dealing with emotions and emotions kind of have a um, certain addictive quality to it, particularly the negative emotions. People, especially nowadays, are highly trained to experience negative emotions of anger, frustration, anxiety, and whatnot. And as uncomfortable and unpleasant as those things are, we still tend to go towards them and experience them habitually, right? What, you know, think about the news. People watch the news even though they know it puts them in an anxious state, yet we want more of that news, right? So when you're doing the training in this program, what will happen is you might push yourself too hard and try something too difficult and then you'll stay here and get this negative emotion of like ah, I can't ah, ah. and then you keep just resetting it and training yourself to experience that negative emotion do not do this this is the worst thing you can possibly do for your training not just here but in any kind of skill why because your brain is very sensitive to negative emotion and the context that it's experiencing it in so if you're in a context and experiencing negative emotion for a long period of time, then when you leave that context, your brain's gonna be like, yo, don't go back there, because I don't like it over there. And then you might say, oh, well, I gotta do it. And then in anticipation of the next training you're gonna do, you go like, oh, I gotta train later, I'm gonna suck at it, I'm so horrible, it's gonna remind me of all the bad things in my life, blah, 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 uh, right? And maybe you'll do it, you'll kind of like, ah, and kind of claw your way in, press play on the practice audio, beat yourself up again, ah, I'm so bad, I hate myself, nobody loves me, right? And then you do that a couple of times and eventually you just give up and you disengage, right? Everyone's been here, we all know this experience and it could be totally avoided if we apply more awareness, more intentionality, more humility to the project, to the task at hand. And instead of going too difficult and too challenging, we start off a little bit lower and make sure that we're in the flow state, make sure we're in the flow zone, flow channel, maybe even the boredom zone first and then slowly increase. That's probably the better way of doing it, right? So while you're training, be sensitive and be aware. Are you, are you in the red zone? Are you experiencing frustration and anxiety? If so, then you need to dial down the challenge. So the next question is now technical. Well, how do we dial down the challenge? Now, what is our task here in general, if you recall? Our general task here is to 
our skill that we're practicing here is the skill of capturing, storing, and reproducing the movements of speech. And we already know that we can, um, or rather more specifically, we're trying to do that at a higher level of complexity, at higher levels of speed, and doing, making it easier and more accurate, right? So if we're trying to mimic or capture, store, and reproduce some speech, and our accuracy is very low, and it's very difficult for us, then all that means is we need to either reduce the speed and or reduce the complexity. So in this program, I'm gonna give you audio at 50%, 75%, and 100%, so you can practice at different speeds. I want you to now to focus on this complexity piece because that's up to you to make sure you choose the right level of complexity. Now, we have these layers here, right? Uh, the melody and the movement, melody breaking down into these parts here. So what we can do in the training is we can ignore certain parts and just focus on the others. So if I have this, nunca lo volví a ver, nunca lo volví a ver, right? Instead of this thing represents my intention, uh, attention, instead of putting my attention on the whole thing, uh, I could just put my attention just on the timing and kind of de-emphasize my attention here. Just selective hearing and attention here. This, this could be in the background, but a foreground the timing of it. So I was like, nunca lo volví a ver. Right? This is what it is. That's a much easier task. If I, I want to synchronize with this. Right, so I'm synchronizing my body or my hands, whatever that task is. That's the first thing we do in this first week, right? Um, and then maybe later on, I can start to add on these other layers like the melody, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other layer of complexity you can play with is right now, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven syllables that we're trying to catch here, right? Um, I can reduce that to just one syllable. So if it's playing, nunca lo volía de, nunca lo... what I can do with my attention is just Focus all my attention just on this first syllable and then kind of ignore the last one. So it's, instead of, nunca lo volví a ver, I hear, nunca lo volví a ver, 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 right? Or maybe uh, I want to do the first two syllables, up the challenge a little bit. Nunca lo volví a ver, 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 right? Uh, or maybe I want to focus on just the last syllable. Right? So what we're doing here is we can direct our attention to just one layer of the timing. And then once that, catching that syllable has been stored in our procedural memory, in our motor memory, and it's just easy and automatic and unconscious for us, then we can expand out the complexity by adding in more stuff. Right? So this, what I'm doing here uh, in my training is I'm moving around. I have a knowledge of what comprises the complexity of the challenge. In this case, it's the, either the layers, these vertical layers of speech, or this horizontal time, you know, which syllable number of syllables am I capturing? And I'm able to adjust those, that complexity to reduce the challenge up or reduce the challenge down based on a sense of whether or not I'm feeling bored or whether or not I'm feeling overwhelmed and frustrated. And what I'm trying to do is calibrate the complexity until I get into that flow state, that e-flow, where I lose sense of time, all of a sudden 30 minutes go by and I get into that groove and when I'm in that groove and I keep on flowing, I come out and pop out and all of a sudden that task I was working on is now easy, it's integrated into my body. And what you'll find, especially in this first week when we're trying to train um, your listening and your timing, when you go out back into the world, you'll feel that you feel a little bit more fit to the environment. Speech will start to show up differently to you, usually in the first week of the program especially if you're a pure beginner or especially if you're an intermediate and you're kind of locked in and you can't recognize any of the words you know, then all of a sudden things start to come out to you, pop out to you more clear because you were finally able to engage at a level that matches your skill and as a result, increase in your ability and become more fitted to that environment, all right? So once again, 
kind of a simple concept to think about it. Just look at this simple graph right here. But really the challenge is, can you apply it in your practice? Can you notice when you slip into the red zone and you're beating yourself up or getting overwhelmed? And then once you notice that, can you figure out what the variables are that you can play with so you can dial down the challenge and the complexity and then find a spot that you can flow in and then allow yourself to slide back into that flow and get better and better and better, all right? So super important concept. See if you can apply it in your training.